And this is going to hinder him going forward because mm. he's refused to say anything. Any time he is the spokesperson, basically, for the Conservative Party yeah. as the chairman, any time he needs to do media now, he won't be able to do so because all the questions are going to be about his tax affairs. Now we have some up-to-the-minute political analysis from the Sunday Times Deputy Political Editor, Harry York. Hello, Harry. Morning. Thanks for being with us again. Uh, so, politics this morning. Look, the big story, it's very silly. The PM fined for not wearing a seatbelt. The Deputy Prime Minister, Dominic Raab, told Times Radio Breakfast that Rishi Sunak is a human being, there's a shock, who made a mistake by not wearing a seatbelt and getting his second fixed penalty fine in, I don't know, a few months. Is this a big deal or a small deal? Uh... It depends on who you ask, actually. <laughs> it's um, it's really quite an unfortunate error, isn't it? And it's actually the, the second fixed penalty notice he's had in under a year. Yeah. He obviously was now infamously uh, fined for the birthday gathering for Boris Johnson. Look, the way to look at this is is more, I think, what does this say about Rishi Sunak? And and I think the damaging for him, actually, is not so much the fine, which I'm sure his, his age will find a way of brushing off in due cause. I think it's just the fact that it's a bit of a dent in his reputation for being very slick and competent. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it struck me as almost like a thick of it moment when you've got the Prime Minister doing a um, you know, a very PR focused video on whilst trying to sell his levelling up message across the country and then he's come completely unstuck yeah. because he's taken it. And he, also he took the seatbelt off. I mean, I, I just don't understand I, the logic. You know what? There. I haven't actually seen the video. Does he take it off in the video? No. Right. He, he, his aides say that he took it off prior to the video being shot. Yeah. Well, they would say that, um, wouldn't they? They yeah. would. They would indeed. Yeah. But no, I think the reality is it just takes a bit of the sheen off, off his image and, and that's the thing that's concerning. That hasn't actually stopped a few of the more mischief, mischievous Tory MPs who are kind of more close to Boris Johnson pointing out that a number of Sunak's allies when he was Chancellor and Boris Johnson was Prime Minister, they were calling for Boris to step down, obviously, when he mm -hmm. was fined. So there is a bit of um, mischief going on as a result of this. Do you think, I mean, do, do we now begin the trawl through every photo of a politician in the, in the back of a car since 1991, finding out how many how many others have, have done it? I mean, I'm mean, i sure that some of my colleagues will certainly be doing that. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like a double-page spread, at least. Uh, look, uh, similar, but obviously more serious, there's, there's Nadeem Zahawi, uh, calls on him to resign as the Conservative Party chairman and from his cabinet position uh, over his tax affairs. Uh, Dominic Raab also speaking to, to uh, well, speaking to Times Radio this morning, he said uh, so Harvey's taxes are a personal matter and that he's paid all he owes and he's doing a great job. Um, what do you think is going to happen there? Can he survive? Is this, is this a more serious story? I think it is a really serious story. And the, the answer to whether he survives or not depends on what comes out subsequent mm. to what we've heard so far. So just to kind of recap on what we know about Zahawi, um, but shortly after he became Chancellor in the summer, it emerged that he was seemingly under investigation by various authorities. And then a tax lawyer called Dan Needle published a very lengthy uh, blog post online setting out what he believed amounted to Zahawi not paying about 3.7 million in capital gains tax. Mm. And the reason for that was basically when Zahawi in a previous life set up YouGov, the polling company, he had uh, a number of shares. He had about 40% of the company in shares. Um, and his co-founder took those shares directly, but Zahawi moved them into a, um, a trust or an offshore company in Gibraltar called Bolshore Investments, um, of which his parents had a controlling state. Now, Zahawi's argument so far is that he never benefited from the trust, um, but subsequently it seems like some sort of money has moved from Bolshore Investments out back to YouGov. So... This was all kind of exposed over the summer. He resorted to just blanket denials about everything. And then we find out last week in The Sun on Sunday that he's actually now reached a settlement agreement with um, HMRC. Uh, Zahawi doesn't give any commentary on this. He, did, he doesn't deny, but doesn't confirm the details. Yesterday, The Guardian reported that this settlement was worth about £5 million and that Zahawi paid a 30% penalty. Mm -hmm. Now, I have also been told by very reliable sources that he did pay this penalty. And that penalty is on the kind of lower end of the spectrum. It's for people who are found to have taken a, a, what's known as a lack of reasonable care mm -hmm. over their tax returns. But it is still a penalty. And that implies that this wasn't some sort of innocent, no-fault settlement. It was a, a case of he had done something which constituted a penalty. Mm. But the, the, the reality is is, to go back to your original question, we just simply don't know. We don't know what they were investigating, HMRC. Um, we don't know the exact details um, of the settlement because Nadim Zahali won't tell us. And when you have someone like Dominic Raab saying and the government saying, well, this is a personal matter, well, that 
that might be true to an extent before you enter into a dispute with HMRC. Yeah. When you're a senior politician and you're in that world, I think the public, and most journalists would argue, the public have a right to know what's happened here um, and precisely how serious it is. And, and crucially, what we don't know is whether Zahawi started these discussions of HMRC when he was Chancellor. Well, of course, because that yeah. would obviously yeah. open up some serious questions if the Chancellor of the Exchequer, who's in charge, basically, of, of HMRC, is in the process of negotiating a tax dispute. And look, without um, asking you to sort of give away your professional secrets, mm. what's the what's the route that can be taken to, to clarifying this story? If Zahawi isn't going to tell us, presumably HMRC isn't obliged to tell us either. Yes, uh, that is definitely tradecraft. Um, <laughs> what I can say is just purely that I've spoken to sources who I believe to know the ins and outs, and he does seem to have paid a penalty, although I should add his his spokespeople are not commenting on that. But uh, I think the reality is it's either HMRC or Nadim Zahawi have to come out and say. And this is going to hinder him going forward because mm. he's refused to say anything. Anytime he is the spokesperson, basically, for the Conservative Party yeah. as the chairman, Anytime he needs to do media now, he won't be able to do so because all the questions are going to be about his tax affairs. I mean, is there a slide, a side sort of flick of this of Rishi Sunak himself, of course, being a very wealthy man? Wealthy people have 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 complicated tax situations. Well, there's no, there's nothing that suggests Rishi Sunak has done anything, anything improper. Mm. Presumably, his his taxes presumably will always warrant great great scrutiny as as such a wealthy man. And you know, if 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 he gets rid of Nadim Zahawi over this, and that's kind of it's pretty obvious what the next story is. It's interesting you say that. I had a very interesting conversation with somebody in Number Ten yesterday about this, and I said, "Well, where's the num what's Number Ten's position on Zahawi?" Mm. Their response is, "With you know, there's nothing to see here. His his tax affairs are a private matter." But I've spoken to a number of people in government about this, and I think the sense is that. The reason why Nadim Zahawi and Rishi Sunak, well, Rishi Sunak doesn't want to go near this, is because you will remember that he was very bruised by the disclosures over his own wife's tax, his yeah. own wife's tax affairs, the non-dom status row that plagued him um, in recent months. So he's probably got that in the back of his mind too. Yeah, well, I mean, you'd, I mean, you'd, you'd hope, you'd hope. Um, well, yes, I mean, you'd hope that he had at least that in his mind. Uh, let's move on, let's talk about Labour. Uh, Keir Starmer and the Shadow Chancellor, Rachel Reeves, they were in Davos this week. Rishi Sunak wasn't, Jeremy Hunt wasn't. Um, is this what, a sort of Labour push to, to be seen as this pro-business, sort of capitalist-friendly party? I mean, Jeremy Corbyn wouldn't have gone, would he? No, he definitely would not. <laughs> Maybe to protest outside, <laughs> exactly. but not actually at the conference itself. This is definitely part of the Labour loving, so mm. to speak, um, for businesses. And Rachel Reeves, the Shadow Chancellor, has actually been doing this for a number of months and actually very effectively. And what we've seen is when, when she started doing these kind of tea rounds with city executives, to begin with, there was a bit of reluctance and hesitance from some city executives because at the time, Labour wasn't really being considered seriously. That's now completely changed. They, they're all queuing up to meet her because they want to find out. You know, Labour is basically a government in waiting if you go by the polls now. Mm -hmm. And they're all desperate to find out more about Labour's economic prospectus. And, and this is not just for Keir Starmer. Davos was not just an opportunity for him to continue that trend of, of getting closer to big business. It is also just a, a chance to announce himself on the kind of global stage. You know, there's a huge amount of international media interest in this event. He was up on the front, on the um, at front at, on the stage, talking with you know leaders of other European countries, and I think also it was a, it was a chance for him to brush shoulders with a lot of EU member state mm. leaders, um, some of whom have talked very positively about him since Davos. Um, and I think what he is also doing, it's not just a charm offensive for businesses, but he's got an eye on the Brexit difficulties that he may inherit if he becomes Prime Minister. Labour's plans are effectively to make us closer economically to the EU if they come to power, but mm -hmm. without actually changing any of the fundamentals, such as re-entering the single market and the yeah. customs union. And in order to do that, you have to foster... Their entire plan is, is hinges on fostering goodwill with those countries. It seems to be working so far, but as we know, when it comes to negotiations, let's see what, what happens. And look, before I let you go, what do you think of uh, Sunak's decision not to go? Is that, uh, is that just because he's, because he's a busy man? Uh, or is, is, that, is that sort of signalling or a, a desire to avoid signalling as well? 
Well, we did we did ask those questions actually when we found out because the Sunday Times broke the story that Starling was going to Davos, and we were asking those questions of government. Why was he not going? I think the reality is he would have faced a lot of media criticism if he'd gone off to Davos with the global elites. Mm -hmm. At a time when the country's in a cost of living crisis, Starmer has the luxury of not being criticised for doing so. Um, and I also think there is also maybe a perception of a, a very, very wealthy man going yeah. to join a load of other very wealthy people. To be with his own. Davos. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, look, thank you very much indeed, Harry York. And you can, can of course, uh, read Harry regularly in The Sunday Times tomorrow and all other Sundays. And as part of a digital subscription to The Times and The Sunday Times, you get access to all the reporting, commentary and analysis from world-class Times journalists. Plus, the app and website have daily interactive puzzles, features, interviews and more. You can also choose from a range of email newsletters and get access to offers, competitions and events. And if you're already a subscriber, make sure you don't miss out on all the benefits. So head online and check it out. Quick Andy Murray update for you. It's two games all in the fourth set of his latest match at the Australian Open. Murray trails now 